I'm excited to be back here. So 2021, I did this, sitting home. How crazy, sitting home in my chair. I had a coat on, I think I had pants on. Um, and I, I'm sure I probably looked like I was being held prisoner, right? Like all those, and I think it was a tool called Skype. You guys remember that? Yeah, so it, uh, I mean, literally just, just a couple of years ago, and I went back and I looked at my notes. So I submitted my presentation, I looked at my notes, and I'm like, oh God, I hope I don't say all the same stuff I did three years ago. And I looked, and I'm like, you know what, there's a lot of things, frankly, that are the same. But the things that are the same, vision, strategy, things that are happening on the grid, some assumptions on, some assumptions on demand, some of the technology. Some of that. What's changed is we, we, I think we're off on some of our demand assumptions. There's going to be, and I'll talk about some of the details, a significant higher amount of demand that was originally forecasted just, just a couple of years ago. We've seen, you know, the advent, we're seeing more EVs. Um, I, it's funny, when I drove here, I didn't even think about my Tesla. I didn't even think about, oh, I assume they have a charger. Thankfully, there was a charger here, so I'm gonna make my way home. But more EVs on the road, more electrification of, of buildings and facilities, and some, and of course, advent of AI. Like, I feel an obligation to shamelessly plug generative AI. Who's gone to a conference and the CIO has not said generative AI? I have to say it's part of the CIO union that I have to talk about it. But it's a real thing. Quantum computing, the opportunities for us are boundless. And I, I do wanna, I have a couple of goals today. Hopefully, when you walk away, you're like, wow, he's a little more interesting in person than when he was being held captive. But more importantly, I want you to walk away with the fact that actually working in a utility is pretty cool right now. I want, I'm hoping that I can deliver that message and convince you of that fact. So maybe just a couple of things about Southern California Edison. Um, we are, you know, we're over 135 years old. It feels like some of our processes are maybe that old as well. We've got equipment out there that's over 100 years old that we need to replace. I'm sure uh, we are not unique, 13,000 employees. 5 million customers, so we have a pretty broad service territory. And of course, we're not the only ones to suffer from this, but from seven, eight years ago, maybe a little less, the amount of increases of wildfire and the challenges that created for us, not to mention our customers, and the devastation that caused, we needed to react, and I'll talk to you about that. But we, we also see, as I mentioned, increases in demand, that the, over the next many years, 90% penetration of electric vehicles, 95% of commercial buildings, we see all those things. That is gonna drive for us many changes in the way we plan and update the grid for the foreseeable future. So our strategy, number one, we have to protect our customers from the devastating effects of wildfires. That's number one accelerating clean, clean power and making sure we have customer programs and working with the state of California to make sure that we can prepare the grid for what's to come. Making sure the tools we have, the technology we deploy are ready for what's come. And we're thinking about how do we better manage the grid in a very different world by the time we get to 2045. And lastly, all of these things rely on technology. Operational and service excellence to our customers, making sure that we operate the grid safely and reliably and affordably, and we also take care of our customers. All of these activities require a lot of technology that frankly was maybe a little bit unforeseen just a couple of years ago and is moving very rapidly. So, wildfires. As I said, we have uh, much of our infrastructure, at least the last couple of years, is pretty old, and we had to rapidly replace things. Um, customer demands, as Tom said, the expectations 
of our customers are, are raising considerably. They try to compare us to Amazon and Google and other companies for that user experience that, frankly, sometimes from our utility is maybe a little bit, a little bit stale. 8,000 wildfires a year, billions of dollars of damages, not to mention the devastating impact to our customers and their families. So really challenging. In the state of California, I'm trying to, not that I could count. Who is a, who's from California here? Okay, so not a lot, all right. So this is all fresh. Um, we have a little thing, and so state of California is a very unique place to live with a lot of different policies that maybe are not exactly like the rest of the country. One of those, as it relates Thank you for the laughter. Um, <laughs> one of those is something called inverse condemnation. Inverse condemnation is if a car hits a pole, pole goes down, fire started as a result of that, the liability sits with the utility. That's a very unique thing for us. So in addition to the goal of we have to protect our customers and customers, no matter what, they don't like when you turn your power off, when we turn their power off believe it or not, even if it's to save them. And so we're actually seeing a little of that now. But the other thing is we also have to protect us from, from liabilities. But the most important thing is to protect our customers. So what did we do about it? Um, these are not, we'll say, fantasies or things we're thinking about. We needed to do something very different. I would say one of the things that utilities do a fantastic job of is people coalescing around a unified front when we're facing an existential threat. We are so good at that. Sometimes we don't do that on a daily basis, but if you think about when we're facing that threat, rallying around a single rallying cry and protecting our customers is a singular goal of all of our employees. So what did we do about that? We filed um, with the commission a plan. And the plan was largely around, we need to think about who is in the most vulnerable areas, high fire zone. We have to do, we needed to do weather forecasting. In fact, we're probably one of the more prominent or preeminent weather forecasters in the state of California because of the weather, weather modeling we had to come up with that didn't previously exist. So hardening our infrastructure, we have deployed something like 80, 70 to 80% of our, we have covered conductors deployed to harden the infrastructure. Our goal is by the end of 2025, 90% of them will be covered. We've had to deploy cameras and satellites and, and sensors and sectionalize and fuse a whole bunch of things to harden and protect our infrastructure from the potential spread of wildfires and we needed to do something very different with the way we were rolling out technology, and we had to move extremely quickly. So what did we do? Um, we deployed new vegetation management systems, new, new ways of doing inspection. We had to deploy supercomputers for weather modeling, as I said, and we've got thousands of weather cameras out there that are ingested. We also had to, we, we pushed ourselves with LIDAR and drones and imagery, and then of course, the shameless plug for AI where we applied machine learning to these images to better identify where we may have faulty equipment as well as apply that to vegetation and make sure we didn't have fuel for the fires. So we pushed ourselves, and in many cases we pushed ourselves in a very non-utility way. We were deploying technology not in years but in weeks and sometimes in months. So we deployed all these things and frankly, when all else fails, we have to declare a public safety power shut off. We're gonna have to turn off your power because we have detected high winds in a heat wave, feels like a heat wave here, um, around your neighborhood, which happens to be in a high fire zone, and we have to turn off your power. When all else fails, public safety power shut off. With all of those tools that we deployed, we actually reduced the probability of the spread of wildfires about by almost 88%. So that was a significant accomplishment. So not over yet, we continue to improve that. Now to the next longer term existential threat, which is, which is the, the heightened demand for electricity 
82% increase by 2045 seems like a really long time, but at the same time, we have to deploy seven times the amount of substations. We have about 900 substations today, 10 times the amount of circuits. I think we have about 1,400 circuits. These don't come fast. They take many, substation build out could take seven, eight, 10 years. So we have to operate and think about the grid very differently from the way we think about it today. So we, over the years, we have been, we somewhat, I'm not saying we perfectly anticipated this. We anticipated that we needed to do something different. We have deploy, deployed various grid technologies to better modernize our grid. Um, I'm not gonna read all this, but, but different planning tools, different operation tools, our ADMS, our control systems. We most recently uh, updated, deployed DERMS capabilities. We will be deploying a new distribution management system by the end of the year in OMS next year, but also um, a new field area network. We recently, I think it was a week ago, we became, now I'm gonna overhype this a little bit, um, the first North American utility to deploy 5G network. But that's like one location. We have 50,000 more devices to deploy over the next five or six years, but it is the beginning. So there's a lot of change. We also had to deploy new cyber capabilities, much like we have in the enterprise system, a new grid data center. So all of these things had to happen to modernize the grid, but more importantly, to make sure we didn't suffer from some technology obsolescence. So there's a lot more than this to talk about. So I talked about the foundational tools. Uh, we expect, just from the grid, we have about 100,000 connection points, sensors. We anticipate that to go to probably six million over the next couple of years as we continue to deploy technology. The convergence of what has been traditional operational technologies that is now becoming more software-based, that's gonna create a very different grid. It's gonna feel like, I feel like, a network of network. In addition to that, am I um, pleased to talk to you about that we are, we are existing iTron customer and obviously we're looking at the future and what that looks like, but we plan on deploying and replacing five million meters. These will be new sensor points. When we first deployed our AMI system, 2012, it was, a, it was a meter replacement and it was a little bit of a cost play. Now it's, that's five million more sensors on the grid to anticipate what a disruption might look like. And then we have to put it all together. Some of the technology, some of the capabilities don't currently exist today. That's why, Tom, I appreciate what you said. It's gonna take all of us. We need to come together as a team, as a group. We need to look to vendors. We wanna look for ideas we are thinking about. We have ideas on this autonomous platform that is self-healing when the grid is gonna go down or there's, or there's some points where there's significant dis disruption. It is self-healing, self-starting, so that the customer has no impact. Some of that is available today, but not at the scale we're gonna need it over the next couple of years. And of course, we're gonna need more artificial intelligence, more machine learning capabilities that don't exist, but it's gonna need to happen through a significant partnership of all of us, as well as our partners, obviously, iTron, Microsoft, Google, NVIDIA, there's a, there's a list of technology partners that we cannot do this by ourselves, and it requires us to think very differently on how we operate the grid. I'm excited that we've made some improvements. We've done a few things on the AI side. We've done a few things on the customer side, on predictive analytics, on forecasting. Uh, we've done things on, on call prediction, on load growth. We've anticipated what we believe to be EV growth in the future, somewhat by predictive analytics, but also some through generative AI. So we're doing a series of activities related to these, whether it's customer or our telecommunications infrastructure. We have deployed uh, machine learning for our customers to actually help when an agent gets a call, there's a little bit of an advisor. Right now, it's almost like a Google search, but in the future, it'll be a conversational chatbot that communicates with customers. Um, I heard some generative AI capabilities we were, we were 
talking to one of our vendors, and they said that there was a study done in the UK. And what happened was a, a customer, or somebody was calling their doctor, and they interacted with a doctor, a real doctor, and they interacted also with a conversational chatbot. Two things happened, a couple things happened. One, they knew it was a conversational chatbot, but then they got better advice from the conversational chatbot, and they found that the conversational chatbot was more human than the doctor. So, I mean, it's, just, it's, a, it's amazing, it's a little bit scary. As I was driving here, I was, I was listening to Elon Musk's uh, biography, and I mean, the things that we need to think about in the future to protect AI, but also to exploit it. So, I leave you with a couple of things. We need to be bold in how we're thinking about technology, AI, how do we leverage the AI to autonomously protect the grid. How do we, if you think about one of the most expensive things we do is inspection. Deploying assets, deploying people, resources to go back and take their tablet with them, record, come back, and based on that information, we'll go do um, infrastructure replacement. What if we had a, a complete digital twin of the entire grid? And when you wanted to replace an asset, or you want an asset condition, you didn't deploy a resource. You looked at your digital twin, and then you deployed resources to do that replacement. Same thing for operating the grid. Overall, more autonomous capability from an AI perspective from switching center. So these things, maybe they're not possible today, but if we're not bold now, we're going to miss out. I, mean, I, I, I think about, again, three years ago, uh, things were very different, and I would challenge every single one of you to do something different. Um, the, when the band was playing earlier, the guy with the cool pompadour, um, I, was remind, I reminded myself, one, I, I learned how to play the guitar. I started you know, 12 months ago. That's a really small thing, but generative AI, all the things that have happened in the last year, the last three years. We were working from home. We were held captive. We're now out, we're interacting with each other. We have to be bold. This is the time I hopefully convinced you that it's actually pretty cool, kind of fun working at a utility and hopefully I've done a better job convincing you of that in person versus sitting behind my desk at home. Thank you so much for your attention.